Shabbat Shalom. Although Passover isn't for a few more months, this Shabbat, we actually read about the final three plagues in Egypt. Next week, we will read about our people crossing the Sea of Reeds into freedom. But before we get there, I want to dwell for a moment on the ninth plague, darkness. Darkness is usually defined as the absence of light. Where there is no light, there is darkness. But the plague of darkness that descended on the Egyptians was of a different nature. This was a darkness that could be felt. It was tangible, and it surrounded the Egyptians. As we read in Exodus, hold out your arm towards the sky that there may be a darkness upon the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be touched. Moses held out his arm towards the sky, and a thick darkness descended upon all the land of Egypt for three days. People could not see one another, and for three days, no one could get up from where he was. Soforno, a 16th century scholar, teaches us that this was no ordinary darkness. It was not created by the absence of light, nor could it be dispelled by the presence of light. Rather, it was a heavy, tangible darkness that kept the Egyptians down. It was a darkness that was all-encompassing and complete. This description begs for further interpretation. What is meant by a heavy darkness that enveloped the Egyptians, rendering them motionless? Was it only a physical heaviness, or was it an emotional heaviness? Often this plague is described as an emotional darkness that made the Egyptians feel stuck. It weighed them down so that they could not arise from their places. How many of us have ever felt there? How many of us have ever been there, stuck in a place, feeling weighed down by the troubles of the world, saddled with sorrow, tangled up in our troubles, and weighed down by our worries, feeling as if there's no way out? After three days of this heavy, all-encompassing darkness, Pharaoh could take it no more, and once again pleaded with Moses to reverse the plague and promise to let the Israelites go. Moses and God oblige only to have Pharaoh once again renege on his promise, finally to fulfill it after his only son dies. While the Egyptians languished in their lonely darkness, the Israelites, on the other hand, had light in their dwellings. But like the darkness that descended upon Egypt, this light was also not of the normal kind. This light didn't come from the sun because that would have provided light to the whole land. Rather, this light came from within their dwellings. This notion that the Israelites had light in their dwellings but not in the land strikes me as unusual. A close reading teaches us that the source of this light is not known. It doesn't say that God provided this light, simply that there was light. We're often taught that in much the same way as the Egyptians were made heavy with darkness, so too was the soul of the Israelite illuminated from within. As the prospect of freedom was becoming real and even tangible, the Israelites had reason to hope. They were feeling elevated with expectations, encased with courage, and heightened with their hope. Another possibility is that the Israelites created that light themselves. Believing that the end of slavery was near, they were filled with an inner light and lightness that not even the darkness around them could dispel. How elated they must have been at the prospect of finally being free from Pharaoh's relentless rule. So how do we live, a, how do we live lives that summon the light and dissipates the darkness. With all the heaviness and darkness in today's world, it would be all too easy to be enveloped by the darkness, consumed with its troubles. All we need to do is look at the news or glance at our phone notifications to see that death and destruction are all around us. Whether it's nature-inflicted storms or human-inflicted harm from mass shootings, bad news far outpaces the good. And yet, and yet we all know people that are able to maintain their sense of optimism no matter what the circumstances around them. 
It is as if they have an inner source of light that keeps them believing that better days are just ahead. According to Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, we Jews have a source for this optimism. He writes, Judaism insists that history and the social, economical, economic, political reality in which people live will eventually be perfected. Much of what passes for the norm of human existence is really a deviation from the ultimate reality. How do we know this? From the liberation of the Hebrew slaves, the exodus from Egypt. The freeing of the slaves testified that human beings are meant to be free. History will not be finished until we are all free. For Rabbi Greenberg, this story of our liberation from slavery is proof that the world is supposed to be, and indeed will be, a better place. By focusing on the fact that we have something to look forward to, he is able to keep up his optimism even when the world we're living in is far from ideal. And he is far from the only optimistic Jew. For others, like Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, our continued survival itself is a source of optimism. For 3,000 years, we Jews, often a persecuted minority, have managed to defy the odds and survive and thrive. Time and time again, we have seen the impossible made possible. How many times in our history should we, a small persecuted people, have vanished from the earth? And yet, we're still here. Israel is another source of eternal light, optimism, and hope. For 2,000 years, our people kept up hope that that land would once again be returned to us. So hopeful are we as a people that the Israeli national anthem is entitled Hatikva, the hope. As Theodore Herzl teaches us, Im Tirtsu Ein Zuagada, if you will it, it is no dream. We Jews, we modern Jews like our ancient ancestors in Egypt are an ever hopeful people. We know that the path to a better, safer, more peaceful world will not be easy but we continue to believe it can and will be achieved. And with that continued belief, we continue to relent relentlessly pursue it. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>